Good evening, I'm Valerie Gross, and on behalf of myself and my co-president of Orabenheim, I would like to welcome you all to our virtual event. I do hope this will be our last virtual event and that we'll be able to greet you in person again soon. Thank you for joining us tonight and for your continued support of Emuna and our projects in Israel. We are fortunate tonight to be able to recognize many people from within our own community. Mazal tov to all of you. Thank you for leading our community by example and for inspiring us all. Dear friends, supporters, leaders, and affiliates from all across the globe of World Emunah, I'm so pleased to greet you today, both as the President of the State of Israel and, more importantly, as the loving grandson of the founding president of this distinguished organization, my beloved grandmother, Rabbanit Sarah Herzog. World Emuna, the International Organization of Religious Zionist Women, represents three fundamental values deeply rooted in my upbringing, which motivated me and my worldview from childhood. Profound religious faith, devoted love of Israel, and unqualified admiration of the power of women. My grandmother, Alea Shalom, who encompassed these core principles, would have been beaming with pride in light of the extraordinary evolution facilitated by each and every one of you, thanks by no small measures to President Dina Han and Emunah Chair Lior Aminka. Through World Emunah's remarkable services, each of you is a change maker. You've continuously supported vulnerable groups and individuals, cared for children and educated teens, empowered women and built stronger communities. Thank you for the lives you have changed and for all you continue to do. And may Emuna go from strength to strength. That's Lacha. everyone, my name is Devorah Abenheim and I am co-president of Emuna Montreal. The remarkable song Biglal Haruach and the video that accompanied it demonstrate the groundbreaking work that is being accomplished in Emuna centers throughout Israel. Biglal Haruach is loosely translated as because of my spirit and is an apt choice for this campaign as the inner strength, might and spirit of the children of Emuna help them lift themselves out of their challenging life situations and difficulties they encounter. 
The students in the video are from Emunas Nevet Sarah Herzog High School in B'nai Brak. We know with certainty, however, that the dedication and tenacious spirit of the Emuna staff who work alongside these children, teenagers, and women makes all the difference. This partnership, this symbiotic relationship between all the working parts is the reason why so many people now have hope for their future. They have a reason to live and thrive and to be contributing members of their society. They know they are worthy of respect and love. Biglal Haruach, because of the spirit and guidance of these change makers, a better and brighter future is possible. The motto of our Amuna Virtual Fall Gala is a famous quote taken from Zechariah 4 6. Lo bechayil velo vekoach ki im beruchi amar Hashem tzvaot. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This quote embodies how we feel about those who continue to donate their time and resources to help Emuna thrive. Hashem, in this passage, is reassuring Zachariah that he himself will carry out his plans by his own spirit. Although we do not understand Hashem's ways, it is nevertheless our responsibility to have Emuna, to have faith and to trust the word of God. In reference to the work that Emuna does, we are blessed to be messengers of Hashem, and we want to continue to use our faith to propel us in lifting up those who need it, financially, emotionally, physically, and socially. We were all created in the image of God, and just as He lifts, we can lift as well. Every single person we are recognizing here tonight have their own supremely beautiful and unique inner spirit and ruach. They are motivated to help and contribute so much to those who seek out their support and guidance. These individuals are the true change makers in our community. Thank you. This evening is about an extraordinary organization and some very special people. We recognize members of our Montreal community, as well as those in Israel who strive every day to improve and positively impact the lives of people around them. It is also about the thousands who have received and benefited from the love, support, care, guidance, and warmth of the Amuna family. Whether on the giving or the receiving end, we all need spirit of body, mind, and soul to change things for the better and to fulfill our dreams. Amuna strives to better the lives of all members of Israeli society, from its youngest, most vulnerable members to its cherished but often isolated golden agers. Tonight, we will show you just how critical Amuna is to those who benefit from Amuna's work from interventional daycare centers and children's villages, to high school and post-high school support services, crisis centers and family shelters, Emuna is truly a change maker in the life of every single individual it touches. Not only does Emuna provide care and support, it gives thousands of our brothers and sisters in Israel the ability, resilience, tools, and spirit to change the trajectory of their lives always for the better. During the program, we will highlight the newly opened Amuna Women's Shelter, a first of its kind for Amuna. Tonight's program will also recognize different individuals in the Montreal community, many of whom are longtime members of Amuna, who have touched our lives in one way or another, from children to seniors, and those who need support and intervention in times of crisis. We recognize these change makers within our Montreal community, just as we recognize how Amuna touches the lives of so many in Israel. We thank you for your ongoing support. By helping us this evening, you give Amuna the spirit, the ruach to continue our important work and to be change makers in the lives of countless people in need. I began my teaching career in Montreal teaching grade one, I taught for a number of years. And then as my family began to grow, I stayed home to raise my kids. And at a certain point, I was asked if I wanted to return to teaching. I usually would say, no, I'm not interested. But this time I was intrigued. I was offered a position to teach early childhood education, something I'd never done before. And it kind of triggered my imagination. I decided I would take it. And that's when I went back to teach early childhood education. And to me, early childhood education is kind of an interesting place because it's a transition point between the family, between the home and that world out there. And early childhood education, the early childhood centers and early childhood 
places of learning are safe places where kids can get tools, where they can learn to maneuver their this chaotic, chaotic world that they're going to go enter, that they'll be entering very soon. So I think that's kind of what it sort of has always inspired me. One of the good things about COVID, if I can use that term, has been the appreciation of early childhood education and early childhood teachers. And I think that the government has become very much aware of it. And that is why teachers recently were able to get the increases in salary, mainly because of the people realized when they didn't have early childhood education and early childhood educators, they realized what an impact it did on their child's lives. I can just tell you that one of the children had been away for a few months. She was a very quiet little girl. I remember she came back, it was in the summer. We were open after lockdown. And she said to me, where are my friends? Where are my friends? And I realized that they have a life. They have a social life. They need that. We provide that for them. We provide them this extension of their, their loving family and home. We provide that wonderful support for them. A number of years ago, we had this little child, this beautiful little boy who came to us. He was silent. He had almost no um, expressive language and almost no receptive language. And if you don't have those skills, you don't have social skills as well. If you can't talk, you can't play. And we found out that this child had a 90% hearing loss, which was fixable, fluid in the ear. So when he left us, he had made some improvement, but he still was a silent child. A couple years ago, I was in the mall, and I noticed a group of, um, let's say, older teenagers, all animated, laughing, joking, talking with one another. And for some reason, I looked at one of the kids there, one of these men, and was actually a young man, and I looked so familiar, and I just couldn't place, I couldn't place the face, because I had just, I guess I had lost touch of this child, of course, as the years had gone by. And as I left the mall, I suddenly realized who this child was. This child is, is no longer a child. And I realized it was that little boy who was so silent. And he was animated and talking and joking with his friends. He was, he was another human being, he was amazing. And I, I, I was walking, I think, a bit of, an inch above ground after, I, after I'd seen that. מאוד אהבת החליטי של אמונה באשדוד הוא מעון שהוא בית, הוא בית למשפחות, הוא בית לילדים. אוכלוסייה שמגיעה לכאן היא אוכלוסייה שנמצאת במצבי סיכון, ואימא שעוסקת בזנות או הורי נרקומן, עולים חדשים שהבתים שלהם ריקים, לפעמים אין אוכל בבית, אין מיטות. הילדים מגיעים לכאן במצבים רגשיים מאוד קשים. שמתפרקים פה, אנחנו מרגישים את הרעד בגוף שלהם. במקום שהבית יהיה הבית, המקום המגן והבטוח, הבית הוא המקום שמסכן את חיינו. נולדתי ברוסיה, כשעלינו לפה הייתי בת שלוש וחצי, כשהייתי בת עשרים וארבע וחצי, עברתי לפה לאשדוד. כשנולדה לי הילדה הראשונה, לא היה לי באמת מי שילמד אותי איך להלביש אותה או לקלח אותה. אני לא יודעת מה לעשות ואיך לגדל ואיך לחנך. בעלי לא עבד, אני לא עבדתי. לפעמים כאילו אני צריכה טיטולים או מטרנה או משהו ואין כסף לקנות. באותו רגע כאילו מפחיד שהרווחה תיקח את הילדים, שהיא תגיד שאנחנו לא מסוגלים לגדל אותם. יאנה הגיעה אלינו, מאוד מפוחדת. לא היו לה שום כלים לגדל את הילדים. היא לא ידעה שילדים מגדלים, וזה לא חפצים. היא פשוט הייתה ילדה שמגדלת ילדים. אנחנו אמרנו שאנחנו לא מוותרים על ביאנה. ברגע שהיא הבינה שאנחנו שם בשבילה, ביאנה התחילה להתחבר ולהצטרף, ולהגיע לקבוצות ולהדרכות ולפעילויות ולשעת כיף של הורה וילד. קיבלתי פה הרבה תמיכה, הרבה, הרבה הקשבה. השינוי שעברנו ביגר אותי גם קצת, ולמדתי איך להתקשר עם הילדים שלי. וזו הצלחה ענקית. גם הילדים נשארים בתוך הבית, וגם האימא קיבלה כלים, והיא נהנית מהגידול של הילדים שלה. האתגר הכי גדול שלי זה שאם שולחים אליי משפחה ואומרים לי, היא, 
אין סיכוי, לא יוצא ממנה שום דבר, להפוך את זה, שהילד יישאר בתוך המשפחה והמשפחה תעבור שינוי. אנחנו מאמינים בכל מאודנו שאפשר לשנות. לראות את המשפחה מתקדמת ושהילד נשאר בתוך הבית, זה, ה... זה העושר. אני חושבת שכל אחד זכאי לקבל את הצ'אנס שלו בחיים. זה מה שאני חושבת, שאנחנו צריכים לתת צ'אנס. אסור, אסור לוותר. אסור לוותר. I got into early childhood education by chance. I was a stay-at-home mom, and when my younger daughter started nursery at the Y, the director asked me to sub. From that, developed my passion for teaching young children, and that has been my life career. I have been in early childhood education for about 38 years. First, the nursery, then the daycare at the Y. In 2015, I retired and quickly realized that I missed teaching. My granddaughter, Sarah, was in Hebrew Academy at the time, and I applied to work in the daycare. Fortunately, I was hired part-time and still very happy to be at HA. My favorite part, being a daycare teacher, is to watch the glint in the children's eyes when I read do science experiments, cooking, taking a walk, playing in the park, etc. I am able to see how much the children have grown academically, socially and emotionally. It is so great to see them get along, play, be happy and learn. After 38 years of teaching, I have come across many children who have left a fantastic impression on me. Teaching is a magical thing. It makes me smile, laugh and cheer every day. It is both exhilarating and exhausting, yet I can't imagine it not being part of my life. The day I laugh the loudest is when little Jake said, Maura, you're very old. I agreed with him and then proceeded to ask him, how old do you think I am? His answer was 25 years old. With a smile on my face and excited voice, I asked him how he was able to guess the right answer. Hello everybody, my name is Sonia and I'm in charge of the donor relations here at the Emuna Achuzat Sarai Children's Home. Achuzat Sarai is a warm and loving home for over 90 children ages 8 till 18 who were referred to us by the welfare department to save them from the neglect, from the abuse they had at their home. All the children suffer from all kinds of different disorders and also PTSD. Um, our, our uh, goal here at Achuzat Sara is to break the cycle and we do it with all kinds of different therapies and programs that are tel tailor-made for every child. פינת החי והטיפול בעזרת בעלי חיים עוזר לילדים בגלל שפינת החי מזמנת כל מיני מצבים שקשה לדבר עליהם ביום יום. קשרים, קשר בין הורים לילדים, קשר עם אחים, נושא של ניקיון ולכלוך, היגיינה אישית, אובדן, כל מיני נושאים שקשה לדבר עליהם ביום יום ובפינת החי הם מאוד נוכחים, אז אפשר לעבוד עליהם. כל חיה שאני מביאה לפה, יש לה איזושהי מטרה. הנחש הוא מפחיד. זה מאפשר לילדים להתחבר למקום שלהם, המפחיד קצת, המאיים. הערבים שהם רצים כאלה, הם מרגיעים מאוד. האוגרים תמיד מנסים לברוח, תמיד מנסים להשתחרר. לכל חיה ממש יש את ה... את מה שהיא מייצגת אצלנו, בנפש שלנו, וזה בעצם מה שזה, ככה, עם זה אני משתמשת בטיפול. אני אשתף אתכם בסיפור שממש מלווה אותי פה מהרגע הראשון בעבודה. ממש בשבוע הראשון אני נכנסתי, היא נכנסה אל הילדה, שהיא ותיקה פה כבר שלוש שנים. והתחילה ממש לכעוס עליי, לתקוף אותי על זה שאני אומרת שאני אוהבת חיות ואני קולטת אותם בכלובים. היא ממש לא הסכימה לוותר לי, אמרה לי שצריך לשחרר את החיות לטבע, לבית שלהם. ממש היינו צריכים לעבוד על הכעס הזה, ובמשך תקופה ארוכה זה היה הנושא. 
הכעס הזה, והאם החיות צריכות להיות בבית שלהם בחוץ, איפה יותר טוב להם. אחרי שלושה חודשים היא הגיעה אליי ואמרה לי שהיא רוצה עכשיו לטפל בחיות, לעזור להם בתוך הכלובים, לתת להם משחקים שיהיה להם יותר מעניין, לתת להם אוכל מיוחד, שהיא התחילה להביא ירקות מהמטבח של הפנימייה. היא הייתה באה לכאן בימים שאני לא נמצאת, מתקשרת אליי עם איזה חיה, היא צריכה איזה עזרה מיוחדת, ממש לקחה אחריות על פינת החיים. וכשדיברתי עם העובדת הסוציאלית שמלווה אותה, העובדת הסוציאלית סיפרה לי שאחרי שלוש שנים הילדה התחילה לקבל את המקום שלה בפנימייה, ומתוך הקבלה הזאת היא הייתה מסוגלת להתחיל בעצם לטפח את עצמה ולדאוג לעצמה. מתוך ההבנה שזה המקום שלה, וזה המקום הנכון לה כרגע. זה ככה מלווה אותי ב... בעבודה פה. About four years ago, I did social work. I did a few stages, all involved art therapy. And when everybody's looking down at their papers, concentrating on what they're doing, that's when some emotions come out, whether it's crying or frustration or moments of happiness, it's because people don't realize that they're talking because they're so concentrated on the art. It also gives them an amount of satisfaction and pride and some self-assurance and confidence when everything around them is really beaten down. I did art therapy with people with different kinds of uh, physical and mental uh, disabilities. Most of them were nonverbal, but their faces showed the pride they had on any coloring or sticker art or cheerio art that we did. There was this one uh, man, he's in his 50s, and he has uh, Angelman syndrome, which is close to my heart. <laughs> and uh, every time he would see me, he would clap his hands and I would feel like I'm seeing my niece in, in, that, in that person. And what he loved was Cheerios, stringing Cheerios on licorice and then eating the Cheerios. So I would hold his hands, he would put it in, and then just seeing me through the window, you could see him clapping. And the minute all I had to say was Cheerios and a big smile would come up onto his face. I've given lifts to older people. You see them walking with their heavy bags. It doesn't take us more than an extra five minutes to ask, do you need help? I think if every one of us does just one extra thing, not even a day, every two days, every three days, pick up the phone, send somebody a text message, um, speak to an older person in the street. They're so lonely. So many people are so lonely. Just a little bit, just show a little bit of warmth and you'll see that it gives you way more than what you're giving them. I have been doing some gardening recently for the past five years and I've turned it into a little bit of a business, I guess. Um, but it's something that I very much enjoy and I'm hoping to encourage. I started doing it more for friends and clients and then I ended up getting paid for it because it's also very time consuming. And so eventually it evolved more into a business. I didn't know that you guys, that there was garden therapy. So when I found out that was kind of, that was the get go for me. That was what got me interested in this project. Um, my name is on the invitation, but not in the way that it should be. It's more to be a participant in this because I feel that it's such an exciting um, possibility for the kids. I think that anytime you put your hands in the earth, you feel great. You grow something, you become attached to it, you watch it blossom, you watch it continue to grow. Um, it makes you feel good. It, I believe that it actually, in, you know, it releases certain, certain endorphins, like exercise, like art. I think anything that gets us out of this um, stagnant type of, you know, what our basic like technology or just doing, you know, your your mundane type of uncreative, un, I think it's a different section of the brain, basically. And it feels, and it's great. And that's why I do it. Uh, my late grandmother, her name was Jean Quint. I think with her, I think it was the children 
She did, we went to visit Neve Michael after she died. And when you go there, you see. You know, it's 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 everything's important. Every charity is important. This particular one is very important, especially right now. גינון הטיפולי, יש מגוון מאוד גדול של אפשרויות. אפשר לטפל באנשים מבוגרים, אפשר לדבר, לטפל בילדים, אפשר לטפל בילדים עם לקויות שונות. אפשר להתאים לילד שצריך עבודה קטנה, עדינה, הוא ככה נכנס עם העדנית, עם האצבעות, וילד אחר יעבוד עם הכוש ועם טוריה. אפשר להתאים את הצורך. להרבה מאוד ילדים ומגוון גדול של צרכים ולקויות. זו היכולת המיוחדת של גינון טיפולי. המיוחד בגינון הטיפולי, שבעצם המטופל, הילד, הוא הופך להיות מטפל. הצמח גדל בזכותו. הילד מרגיש שמישהו צריך אותו, מישהו מחכה לו. יש לו יכולת לראות שהוא נותן. שהוא מעניק חיים למישהו. אני יכול לזכר באיזה סיפור נחמד, ממש קרה כאן בחממה הזאת, ילד גידל עגבנייה. אז הוא לוקח את הזרע, שם באדמה ומחכה, בהתחלה זה נובט קטן, רק העלים, גדל, גדל, מתפתח, גדלה עגבנייה, ובהתחלה ירוקה, ולאט לאט היא מאדימה ומתנפחת. ויום אחד הוא מגיע לחממה כאן, והוא רואה שהעגבנייה הגדולה והאדומה עומד בפתח החממה, וככה עם הידיים הוא צועק. עגבניה שלי הדהימה. הוא אומר לי, אני יוצא לסיבוב השבצות, אני הולך להראות, היי, איזה יופי, מה אני גידלתי. אחרי שבוע, פוגש אותי המנהל, הוא אומר לי, אתה זוכר את הילד משבוע שעבר עם העגבניה? אני אספר לך, אתה לא ראית את הכול, אני אספר לך את ההמשך. למחרת בבוקר, הילד הזה, שהוא ובית ספר, זה שני דברים שונים. בבית ספר הוא כל הזמן מקבל הערות, למה אתה עומד, ולמה אתה יושב, ולמה אתה מדבר, ולמה אתה שותק, ותלמד, ואת... כל הזמן הערות, וגערות, והוא לא מצליח, ו... והוא היה למחרת הראשון בתור להסעה עם העגבנייה. הוא הולך להראות למורים שלו, אתם חושבים שאני לא שווה כלום, אתם חושבים שאני אפס, אתם חושבים שאני לא יכול? תסתכלו, את העגבנייה הזאת <אח> אני גידלתי, אני שווה, יש לי כוח, אני שווה. וזו התחושה הטובה, שילד מרגיש שווה. Uh, currently I am the president of the Kol Tor Mitzion in Montreal. I do, uh, I help out with uh, Hebrew Academy on a bunch of uh, subcommittees at Hebrew Academy. I'm uh, very involved in different chesed uh, aspects of the Bailey Shul, TBDJ. I uh, help out with MADA at uh, different aspects of MADA. And um, I went on the March of Living with, uh, via the Federation a couple years ago and try to stay busy with uh, different aspects of the Federation as much as I can. And I'm just involved because I married him, and so I have to stay involved in the community and do chesed. Firstly, I see what an impact um, my husband does in the community, and I see how um, it brightens and helps so many people's lives. So that gives me the strength, and it shows me the opportunities that I can do for other people. So that makes me want to do more. Mirsi Muffins was uh, an offshoot of uh, feel the Love, which was part of uh, the QSIS um, in Montreal, which is a lot of uh, different um, uh, nursing homes um, and old age facilities in Montreal. Uh, they asked um, to help bake, bake goods for the frontline workers at QSIS. And then when Feel the Love ended, uh, I think it was St. John Baptiste, we decided with a bunch of people to continue the baking. And that's when Mercy Muffins was born. Uh, we continued it for a good year. Um, hundreds of baked goods, all smelled really yummy, uh, were delivered to all the different uh, nursing homes and old age facilities and then we branched out to uh, delivering to the post office, uh, police station, fire station, um, the public works, public security, uh, various um, civil workers in the Cote St. Luke, Hampstead, Montreal community. I, just to add to that, I was currently on maternity leave and seeing all my colleagues and healthcare workers uh, working so tirelessly during the first part of the pandemic, I felt that this was my way that I was able to give back to them for showing my appreciation towards them for doing all their hard work. For me, I find baking very therapeutic. After a long day at work and I just want to let loose, I'll just put up a batch of challah because for me, that's therapeutic. It's just relaxing, mixing the dough, um, and then at the end of the day, 
you have this beautiful masterpiece that you created and you feel good about it. The same for these children. They're creating something that they made on their own. Um, and I think that it will make them feel so proud and feel good about themselves. Um, for kids that are coming from with very low self-esteem or don't feel good about themselves and with just a few ingredients, you can create something so delicious and so beautiful that they can really feel good about. It's flour, water, uh, baked sugar, it's simple ingredients, but when it's all combined together, it makes something beautiful. And I think that uh, with all different kids and coming back, coming from different backgrounds, I think it's, it's a way of mixing all these different backgrounds of the kids into something beautiful. And it's the outcome is seeing the, what Amuna does for the children. Ладите бы Украина, полите ларцы, багильха мы еще сре по мезгеру тохнет на але, но ар олели в ней горим. В яшаре гати леул пенат не весь райерцок, что немцет был бней брак. Гарти поливад, лой карти афехад, лой я дано это сафа. Во пнемия багашну бы цевет хам в огев, в бемурим, что томхим в мелавим, а бы цефер тамида я итану. А нахну асину арбети юли, мы карну это арец мицафона да даром, асину по багруют, в ливу итану мяле фатав. В каха ишталавну леат леат бехевра израилит. Ле ульпенат не весь райерцок, еш хеле гадол бейцу вайши юджили. Кшаламадете бе университет, תמיד ליוותה אותי ההרגשה החמה הזאת, העוטפת של המקום, וידעתי כשאני אסיים את לימודיי באוניברסיטה, אני אחזור לנווה שרה, זה הבית השני שלי. מבחינתי זה סוג של סגירת מעגל. כיום כמורה מחנכת של כיתת אולפן, בנות שעלו מאתיופיה, חשוב לי מאוד להשקיע בכל תלמידה, לחלוק את הניסיון שלי עם התלמידות ולתת כלים להשתלבות מוצלחת בחברה הישראלית. So my, my grandmother, Lily Mayoran, uh, was very, very active in Emuna for many years. Whenever I would speak to her, she would always find a way to bring Emuna into the conversation and, and she, would, she would rally the family around this cause that, that, that she really believed in, that we that we adopted as, as our cause as well. And I mean, over over 40 years ago, she was the president of Emuna Canada uh, and was very involved in the Neve Mikhail Children's Village in Pardes Chana in Israel. And I, I, I even had the opportunity to, to visit it myself. And I, I'm an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur in Montreal who's just trying to do good, some good in the world. The purpose of, our, of, of my work is to make the world a better place. It's actually, I'm actually running a non-profit right now, meaning that the profit we generate, we reinvest into the company so that we can grow it and better, uh, better benefit our communities, uh, which uh, in our case are our students in, in public and private schools across Canada. My company is called E2 Adventures, or in French, Aventure E2. And the idea came to me because I was asking myself, how come schools don't go outside into the real world, right? Whenever we do a field trip, it's usually to a, a museum or, or to a play, things that have, were written in the past or are reflecting the past. But what about field trips to the present? When do kids ever get a chance to see in action the things that they're reading in the news or the things that are being discussed in schools? Why do we spend so much time in schools? We work with, you know, with researchers from McGill University as well as students from their master's and PhD program to help us make connections between the real world and what's taught in school. We tell people all the time, our field trips are cross-disciplinary and they look at us with skepticism. How can your field trips touch on math, science, social studies, and language arts? What we tell them is, you know, it's not our field trips that are cross-disciplinary, it's the world. The world is this budding, blooming thing that brings the things you're talking about in class to life. Our vision of the future of education is that students spend, spend some significant percentage of their time outside of the classroom, experiencing the world, just gain, gaining knowledge. And the classroom is, is, is the, you could say, the social laboratory that you use to prepare for your field trips and to also to debrief from them, you know, getting knowledge out from the world instead of only from textbooks, only from 
and only from third-hand accounts. You know, if school's purpose is to prepare kids for the world, how come we don't visit the world? אלימות במשפחה, אלימות ככה מורכבת, הרבה כעסים. אני גדלתי בתחושה הרבה של אשמה, לא הרגשתי אהובה, בטוחה. ממש התניידתי מבית לבית, הרגשתי בתור ילדה, לא היה לי מקום יציב ובטוח ואחד. וזהו, והיה יום אחד בכיתה ד', והגעתי לבית ספר, היו לי סימנים על הגוף, וחברות שלי שאלו אותי מה זה, ואז אמרתי להם, מה, הגעתי מאוחר, אז אבא שלי, כאילו, הכי טבעי. אבא שלי נכנס לכלא תוך שלב מאוד מאוד קצר מהידיעה הזאת. ואני נכנסתי למשפחה אומנת, ושם הייתי מאוד מאוד אלימה. כאילו, ברמה שאני מרביצה לילדים, ואז הלכנו לאחוזה צרה. בסוף יש לי שם איזו ילדה כל כך פצועה ופגועה. שהיא לא גילתה עדיין מי, וכל האלימות, וכל הביטחון שהיא מראה, וכל הזה, זה בעצם מנגנונים כדי לשמור עליה, ולא ידעתי את זה. ובטיפולים גיליתי עולם שלי. בסוף החוכמה, אני חושבת, זה לא באמת כל הזמן להציל אותה ולתת להם כסף. המטרה שלנו זה בסוף לתת להם חכה. אנחנו לא רוצים לתת להם את הדגים. אני חושבת לתת להם את האפשרות הזאת לצמוח ולהתפתח כמה שאפשר, כאילו באמת שהם יצליחו להמריא למעלה. הכלים שקיבלתם מהפנימייה... קודם כל, ויסות רגשי לא היה לי בכלל. לא הייתי יודעת להתמודד עם מצבים שפתאום אתה שומע לא. קיבלתי גבולות, שהגבולות האלה כל כך חשובים גם לי היום בחיים, שאני יודעת לשים לעצמי את הגבול הזה של עד לפה. היה לנו סדנאות כמעט בכל התחומים, זה בתחום הזוגי, שאנחנו נצאת עכשיו לעולם, ואולי נכיר אה, גבר ונהיה במערכת יחסים. היה לנו סדנאות אה, פיננסיות, אה, כלכלית, איך אני מסתדר. עבודה שאני מאוד מאוד אוהבת, כאילו אני באמת קמה כל בוקר עם חיוך על הפנים ומרגישה ב... בעשייה ועם משמעות ושהכנסתי לי עוד ערך לחיים שהוא מאוד מאוד גדול. מההצלחה הכי גדולה אני חושבת שהיום מי שמסיים את הפנימייה יודע שיש לו כתובת, שיש לו בית, שיש לו למי לפנות. באמת הרגשתי שאוהבים אותי גם. חוויה של הרבה מהילדים שמגיעים לכאן, שהם שקופים, שלא רואים את הרצון ולא רואים את החלום שלהם. האמונה רואה אותם. Hi, Daddy. Hi. How did the connection to Amuna come about? The connection to Amuna, well, I'm a young guy. I'm by now a professional engineer. And there's my mother, who doesn't speak a word of English on the street, buttonholing people and selling them tickets. And I had no idea. And they were Amuna tickets because she, some of her buddies got her into Amuna. Uh, and here she is working for Amuna. Uh, I didn't know she had that kind of courage and... Uh, She eventually got, I got married, as you know. Uh, I eventually got my, I found out that she kind of recruited my wife into Amuna, and I believe eventually my daughter as well. What I really loved was the bazaar. I loved the bazaar. There was something exciting about Amuna Bazaar. And I helped out. We were schlepping and snoring stuff and setting up. We did it for a few years. When I was in grade 10, uh, I was a good student, but I also realized that I know how to explain things. Started to tutor kids, mainly to impress the girls. The next milestone was 1968. I'm one of the youngest managers in the Canadian aerospace industry, and I have 220 people working for me. Uh, by union rules, we lay off the youngest people. So I went down to St. Catherine Street, the one and only bookstore. And I bought a book called How to Write a Resume. And I read the first three chapters. Came back to the office, let it be known, I cannot save you a job, but I can help you write a CV. The next milestone was 1997. My daughter Leah is applying to medical school. So I studied the guidelines and we did the applications and the personal statements, the works. Then we did the interviews um, and after two hours, She wasn't good. I was really worried. Then she sent me some of her friends, and I think within six years, I was up to, it's all word of mouth, to 
20 kids a year. Thank God most of the kids come from comfortable home, good health, great achievers. But there have been quite a few kids who had personal medical issues, trauma, family tragedies, and these are the heroes. It's how they deal with their problems. My problem does not define me, it doesn't defeat me, I defeat it. Uh, I look at a kid's CV, she spent three and a half years in seizure, but what happened? Well, anorexia almost killed me. Uh, so she goes back to Miguel and she starts a, an eating disorder society. It's what she does. Last year, I spoke to the seizure kids a few years ago, then she disappeared. She was clearly in pain. She reappeared last year. Well, where have you been? Well, I was in a wheelchair, immobile for a year, but she got her nursing degree. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that she just started medical school. So it's this class of kids who have triumphed over their problems and turned them into assets. I believe that everyone can has some skills that they can offer to the community. If you have money, give money. Amuna needs money. Every institution needs money. But if you're a carpenter, you can fix things in your synagogue, in your school. Um, I stumble into this and I, with other people, there's always something that you can do for your community. Shalom from Yerushalayim. My name is Avram White. I'm director of the Munat Health Family Counseling Center. We're actually one of 12 family counseling centers throughout the country. I'm proud to say that there's over 100 therapists in our centers, each with a second degree in, in the field of mental health. Our centers provide individual, highly professional individual couples as well as family counseling. There's, there's another front line, perhaps less visible, but it's a front line that we, that we know of because we either have a, a family member or a relative or a friend who's coping with dealing with, whether it be depression, anxiety, issues in their marriage, parenting issues. Unfortunately, we also deal with lots of cases dealing with sexual abuse. And so it's our therapists, all 100, over 100 of them, that are at the front lines to ensure, to care for and to tend for the needs of Israelis across this, across Israeli society, who, who are really in, our, in need of help. And we're trying to help them not merely survive, but to get to a place where they're gonna also thrive. Professionally, I am a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice and also the co-associate director of the Jewish General Hospital's Alzheimer's Risk Assessment Clinic. My connection with Amuna started with Mizrahi quite a long time ago. My grandfather in Toronto was one of the senior members of Mizrahi Canada. And my family here, my husband's family, is very involved. My mother-in-law, Bela Aspler, is a past national president. And my sister-in-law, Aviva Drazen, also very involved with the Muna Women of Montreal. And I've been thrilled to be involved myself. I have always been fascinated with how the brain works and especially interested in pathology. As a child and teen, I was very close to my grandparents and got very involved with volunteering with the elderly and Holocaust survivors due to my own personal family history. These became two of my areas of specialization working with the elderly and particularly with dementia patients as well as with individuals who have been impacted by trauma. There have always been people treated for mental health issues, but there has been a significant stigma associated with it, so it has been secretive. Many communities, Jewish and otherwise, perpetuate the stigma, thus discouraging people from getting help or from being open about it. Together with my co-chair, Yair Myers, we wanted to bring mental health awareness and destigmatization to the forefront of the Jewish community. The first Mental Health Shabbat was in May of 2019, in person and local to Montreal. The second Mental Health Shabbat was set to be in person, but with the onset of the lockdown, we had to shift to a virtual forum, and this gave us the opportunity to spread to other cities. This year, we were fully virtual from the planning stages. We had over 50 shuls and 20 high schools across North America participating. I don't usually share patient stories, but I am struck by a story that comes to mind that I have never forgotten. I lived in New York City and about one month prior to 9-11, uh, my job lost its funding and I transferred to work in the Traumatic Stress Studies and Treatment Program. And then 9-11 happened. 
and we created a research and clinical study to treat 9-11 survivors. There is a very famous woman who is known as the Dust Lady, whom I worked with, and I share this with you with permission from her. And she was stuck in the towers uh, on the street and was covered with dust. You can see a photo of her in the 9-11 Museum. She was completely traumatized, both physically and mentally, and became very, very ill due to all the dust that she had inhaled. Uh, she developed post-traumatic stress disorder, and we worked together for months to help her to process this trauma and to be able to move past it. She did really incredibly and was an inspiration to me and to many others, and I feel very fortunate to have worked with her. I was very young when I got married. I was running away from my dysfunctional childhood. I just wanted to be in a strong, healthy relationship, but I didn't know what strong and healthy was. My parents got divorced when I was five years old. I was sexually abused by people that I trusted. Um, people who have a big impact on my life. I never was able to trust anybody. I was addicted to pain, emotional pain. Um, then I entered a really bad marriage. Again, being abused emotionally. I was married to, for 25 years to a man that treated me in front of the children and not in front of the children horribly. We got evicted from our apartment. And I moved into a machsa with my children. I had a little bedroom and a little kitchen. Three of us slept together in one bed. I was seeing a counselor who was assisting me and she said, I know a really good therapist in Amuna who could help you. And I came there and I saw Nancy and I fell in love with her the first day I met her. She helped me by believing in me, showing me my strengths. I was never told of my strengths. I was always told of my faults. And she believed in me when I didn't believe in me. And she made me feel good. I couldn't have done it without Amuna. Emuna has always led the charge in helping the most vulnerable segments of Israeli society. Tonight, I introduce you to one such project of which you may not be aware. Unfortunately, one of the many effects of the coronavirus crisis was the increase in cases of violence towards women. In the past year, women's shelters in Israel have reached maximum capacity, and there is a terrible shortage of services for women and children who have suffered violence at the hands of their father or partner. Emuna answered the call. A new women's shelter in the north of Israel opened its doors recently, a first for Emuna. The goal of the shelter is ultimately to help them find the strength to leave the cycle of conjugal violence and rebuild their lives. It is through the strong spirit and inner power of these women that they will, Bezrat Hashem, be able to help their families look forward to a safe and hopeful future. Emuna and its supporters are there to facilitate and assist them in their journey. So thank you for being with us, to, uh, being here with us today. Through this discussion, we'd like to highlight the main focus of our fundraising efforts this evening, which is the newly opened Emuna Women's Shelter, the first of its kind for Emuna. We'd also like to recognize the work of Joanna and Brindy uh, right here in the Montreal community through Aubert Shalom which is a shelter and external counseling office for women and children affected by conjugal violence. Okay, Emma, if you ask anybody in the Ministry of Welfare, do you, do you know who about Amuna? They're gonna say it's probably the number one home in Israel. During the corona, the COVID, the Ministry of Welfare came up with this innovative idea. We have women's shelters all over Israel, on a street, on the street, in this town, off this highway. Why not establish one in an already existing children's home? Especially because we have a 
children's crisis center on site already, a teenage girls crisis center, the family homes, a special ed school, and 11 acres where the mommies and these little children can walk around and feel free because we have guards at the entrances and guards inside. They have their own cornered off play area and and, and living area and, and the, their whole, the building is uh, their own building. But when they go out and walk around, they see other children, staff members, people say, say hello. They're, they they talk to each other. First of all, we have to make the, mo- the mothers and children feel safe. And remember, everyone comes from a different part of Israel. Everyone comes from a different background. Uh, and the children are all ages, from a month old to around 10 years old. Uh, the children that need special ed can go to the special ed school. Those that need a regular school, we set them up in a regular school with protection, with somebody keeping an eye on them. Uh, the parent, the mothers get therapy. They have a, we have a psychologist, we have a psychiatrist, and they get legal advice. And we have to remember when mommies are in stress and just want to run away, they forget about the important things Uh, secure their financial status, what do they have to do to leave the crisis center and get back home and where they're going to live and what do they do. And we need somebody outside the emotional family circle to give them good advice. Auberge was opened um, following the murder of a Jewish woman in 1984. Um, Her husband murdered her as she was leaving a hair salon. And the National Council of Jewish Women um, activated right away, uh, wanting to create a center for the Jewish community to be able to access culturally sensitive services for them, for um, those who were impacted by domestic violence. Women that come to shelter, sometimes they come, Often they come because they are in imminent danger. They need the confidentiality and the safety that our shelter provides. It's highly secure. It's, you know, uh, steel doors and panic buttons all over the house. Um, but it also happens that one consequence of abuse is is isolation, lack of financial resources. The abuser will separate the woman from her family and her community. And so when she's ready to go, she doesn't have anywhere to go. We are the only Jewish shelter that we know of in North America, in fact. In 2002, uh, we opened the counseling office um, to respond mainly to um, I think Orthodox clients who were a little bit uncomfortable coming into the shelter. The shelter is a mixed environment. In the spirit of Tikkun Olam, we serve all women and children, um, but the only one that is really accessible to, to, to Jewish women. But in order to serve the a more Orthodox community that was maybe not so comfortable coming into that environment, we opened the counseling and resource office. Um, the services we give are a little different than the ones in the shelter because we have more a long-term standard. Um, We have people who are coming in for counseling who don't necessarily need shelter, or we do have shelter clients who after they transition from shelter will come for follow-ups. But a lot of the clients we see we could be seeing for years. I've been seeing some clients 14, 15 years. We also offer child care services there as well. We have a child care counselor who can see children. We offer different various groups, um, support groups, self-care groups. We offer a, a, a large group of services to make the women feel more comfortable, more integrated. The average stay last year was 74 days in the shelter. Um, But, you know, we work with women and make sure that they get into accessible housing, affordable housing, and set them up for success. We are right now the mothers and their children, and we we have right now space for 12 mothers and 30-some children. We're almost full. They can stay for at least six months. We are not going to let a mother with her children leave the shelter until we know that she has an apartment that she can afford, that she has a monthly income which will allow her to live, to live normally. And we'll, we also will have people on the outside that are going to help her. We have had since 2009 an external counseling program, an Amunis external counseling program for families at risk. And 
We have about 80 families that come during the week for guidance and treatment. And it can be mother, her father, and a child. It can be a husband who is going through a terrible time with his wife and he's worried about the children. Women today are not afraid to talk about it, to, to seek help. More and more people are less embarrassed. It's still hard and it's still very hard, but they are not you know, they're allowed to speak up and they're allowed to talk about it and they're allowed to seek help and they're allowed to cry and they're allowed to tell, to talk to people about their pain. And and this is very important. How about, I think you're touching on a really interesting point. I think we make this mistake of thinking people who are affected by abuse are different than me. You know, it's, it's not you and I, but it is. Um, statistically, one in three women will experience an abusive relationship in her life. And we have clients who are lawyers and doctors. Their partners are policemen and judges. The more we talk about it, the more we destigmatize it, the, the more women will feel comfortable to, to speak about it. These women come to us, they feel like they're a piece of junk that they're not worth anything. And we have to give them confidence. We have to tell them how great they are. And and that's what it's all about, making, making people feel good about themselves. And the minute you do that, they're gonna want to get out there and succeed. And I remember I saw one woman who evidently was beaten badly because she had these crazy bruises all over. And I said to her, I, does it hurt? Does it hurt? She said, no, but you have no idea how much my heart is hurting. And, and I, I just, I started crying. What do you, you know, what do you say to somebody like that? You, you just want to hug them and tell them it's going to be better. It's going to be okay. You're here. You're with us now. We're going to help you. We're going to take care of you. And thank God there are today shelters that are able to give women a second chance, professional help, guidance, and really hold their hand and walk with them down the path. אני איתן, בן 83. אני התחלתי לבוא להנה לפני שלוש שנים, משהו כזה. אני בא לפה כי לא כל יום יש לנו אוכל בבית. Many people who live alone and who are elderly just do not have the physical or the emotional strength to cook themselves a full healthy meal. Many of the elderly are widowed or divorced. Some of them do not have children. Emuna Petar Tikva decided to open a restaurant for the lonely people. We give them a reason to wake up in the morning, to get dressed and leave their house, and to come and eat a healthy meal, which really contributes to their well-being. המקום הזה זה עזרה לאלה שאין באפשרותם לבשל ולהכין אוכל. Those who come here, they are sure that they won't be hungry today. מגיעים להנה באמת אנשים מבוגרים מאוד, הם מבודדים. הם אנשים שחסר להם את החוויה הזו. האוכל בצוותא, על יד חברים. אוכל טוב, וחלק לא יוצאים מהבית. I feel like these people have forgotten how to smile. And with time, you see a change in them. It's like for so long they've been alone. And here, they come in and there's someone who cares about them and worries about them. In Mayan Rivka, our staff are all volunteers. They take their jobs very, very seriously. They get very close with the diners, they greet them by name, and the diners feel it and the diners appreciate it, and it gives us such a warm, family-like feeling. It's really nice to be here and to sit and to eat and to drink and to drink. Life is very short, 
and I'm trying to make every day count. And through Emuna, I feel I'm able to do that. I've been very involved in community for my entire life. I continue to be involved in community. I've been the uh, president of Kol Tormatsu in Montreal for the last five years. I enjoy working with people within our community. I think it's important on many, for many reasons, for my children, my children to see. Our, both, both Lori and I are very involved. Uh, important for my kids to see that, uh, the, to give back to our community. So I have a business that's, the name is Parade Healthcare Services. We're a company that provides staffing in the healthcare sector. So the day-to-day -day care is obviously an important part and that's typically why people call us is because they're, they need that help. I think the number one thing is companionship. So at the end of the day, our caregivers become companions, but they, they of course, they're taking care of their individual needs, but they end up becoming companions. Uh, a lot of, a lot of our, our, pri our private clients, our individual clients are alone. Um, they have family, some have families, some don't. Some have families who live in Montreal, some their, their, their families are outside of Montreal and they require, they, they slowly develop a relationship with these people who look after them. And it's very important. I, I mean, we see it all the time in our business. People call our office and they're, they're calling to ask a question, but really they're calling just to talk. So they all, you know, they're, they're getting on the phone with people in our office to find out what time the person might be coming as an example, but really it turns into a conversation because they just like to talk to somebody. So I think companionship is a huge part of it. And we see it time and time again. I've, I've experienced it myself um, where uh, regularly where people just want to talk. Um, so I think that's, that's a big part of what our people provide. I had one client who was many, many years ago who uh, he would call and want to talk and specifically to me uh, as, to, as opposed to anyone else in the office. And uh, when it came to every, uh, we, uh, when it came to time to pay his bill, he'd ask me to come and pick it up at his house. Um, and at first it was, at, at first, so I went the first time and he kept me and he, we talked for a little while and, uh, he, the next time he asked if it can come back again and it was a month later and I went back in and we, again, we, we I went in and we spoke for a little while and then it turned into a regular thing where it was pretty much weekly or every other week where I sat and talked with him and he was a businessman and he wanted to hear about my business and what was going on and had advice and we sat for quite some time and this went on for years. Um, so it, sat, it stuck with me. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer around, but he, I, I often think about him. Uh, he was a successful, a, su a successful businessman and we, he had a lot of um, advice and uh, that, that was very helpful. And it was, it was, it was interesting to talk to him about his, his life and uh, his, his experiences. Unfortunately, also, he, like many people, he had, uh, his wife had passed away at an early, earlier age and his children are no longer in Montreal and he's alone, uh, or he was alone, I should say. And it was, it was, it was something that stuck with me through the years of just sitting with him and talking pretty regularly, sometimes weekly or at least every other week. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing that stuck. My name is Rochelle Rhine and I am the National President of Emuna. What a wonderful celebration of inspiring people and accomplishments. I am so proud to be associated with Emuna and its contributors. Thank you to all of you, our generous donors, for joining us tonight and for your ongoing support. If you have any questions about what you saw in the presentation or if you would like to donate, please contact Lisa Hamawi at the Emuna office. A big yes to our hardworking co-chairs for tonight's event, Yafa Blanche and Cindy Faust. Your initiative and efforts made tonight possible. Mazel tov to all our honorees and thank you for permitting Emuna to recognize your accomplishments. As always, a huge acknowledgement to Lisa Amawi, Montreal Coordinator and Assistant National Director for her tireless efforts and tremendous dedication to all aspects of Emuna all the time. Thank you again to everyone for attending and have a very good night. Happy